grace and mercy and peace to you. My name is Minister Claudine Johnson, and we are going to start. This is for Thursday noon Bible study. But first, I want to say Happy New Year to all those that I haven't seen. And it's been a while since I've taught, so I can say Happy New Year to you. And I hope you had a blessed new year. So we're going to start with the opening prayer, and then we're going to get into the scripture today. Uh, the title of my message today is, Is God Your Shield? And my foundation scripture is coming out of Psalms 3. So we're going to start with opening prayer. Father, we open this Bible study right now, acknowledging your presence in our midst. Help us to find fulfillment in your present and help us to live in such a way that our lives serve as a reflection of your own grace and mercy. Teach us to seek you first, your kingdom, and in a life that brings glory to your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. <clears throat> So I don't know how many of you guys are excited about us starting a new year of 2022. I know in the beginning it has been kind of rough for some. And right now I know we're getting some ugly weather on the East Coast. But, you know, God is still in control. Okay, so let's get started on our message. And like I said, the title is called God is Your Shield or He is My Shield. And I'm going to take this out of Psalms 3. And what we're going to do is take Psalms 3, and we're going to just kind of break it down, well, like you would say, an exegesis on it. And so, in the purpose of my message is to give you a better understanding of what was going on, in, say, in David's life, and then why he wrote this Psalms. And it lets us know that... There are things that also goes on in our life, but we still need to hold on to God. And my goal is, is to help believers to have a better understanding that in the midst of an adversity, God is still on the throne and he is still in charge. <clears throat> And we're going to accomplish these goals. I'm going to give you an introduction, and what I'm going to do with that is kind of give you a backstory or a history on why David wrote this Psalms. Then we're going to break the Psalms down, and then we're going to talk briefly about how this relates to Jesus, sin, and the cross. Then we'll do a summary and then a review. Now, this psalm, there's only eight verses, surprisingly enough, but each part is like, there's only two verses, let me put it this way, is divided into four parts, and each part contains two verses, mainly because it's not in sequence. It's only like watching a preview of something. You're just getting bits and pieces of stuff. But in order to pull it all together, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a backstory. And most of this right now you'll see in 2 Samuel. Now, when we go to Samuel, we look at David. <clears throat> and David had a lot of wives. And during this time, he had a son named Absalom, who he, his mother's name was Micah. She was the daughter of a king of a distant nation. And during this time, a lot of, David Mary had a lot of wives. And a lot of them he married, not because he loved them, but it was more of a political alliance. Um, if you had a country that you were couldn't work things out with, then they would end up marrying off their daughter to the king. That way, it was like, we won't fight because we're family type thing. So out of this, Absalom was, I think of David's kids, was probably one of the, he was really handsome, had long, thick hair, and he had a sister named Tamer. 
Now, he also had another son named Amnon. Amnon was Absalom's brother. You say he was his brother from another mother, which literally that was true. And he had, um, he lusted, I think is a better word, uh, for Tamer. And he would do whatever he could to try to get her attention, but he wasn't successful. So one of his buddies suggested that he pretend like he was sick and that it would make him feel better if Tamer would come and cook a meal for him. So he said, you know, that sounds like a good idea. So he talked to his dad, David, and David told Tamer to go and cook this meal for her brother. And she didn't think anything of it because after all, he's like her half-brother. So she goes and she fixed the meal for him and he's laying on his bed moaning and groaning and he says, oh, I can't feed myself. Could you feed me? So she fixes his food and she takes it in to feed him. But he tells his his servants and her servants to leave the room. So it's just the two of them. And she still probably didn't think anything of it. She probably figured that he had some things he wanted to share with her that he didn't want the servants to hear. But during this time, what he did was he ended up uh, raping his sister. And even though she cried out about what he was doing, no one heard her. And so after the assault was over, he his lust for her dissipated. And I guess he was really ashamed of what he did. So he called his servants and had them to throw her out. And so they came in and ushered her out the door and shoved her out in the street. And he said, and locked the door behind her, which was ultimate disgrace. So she goes home to her dad crying, and he really is very nonchalant about the whole thing. Absalom hears about it. He's livid, and he's upset with his dad because his dad didn't do anything. But in the meantime, he takes his sister, and he takes her to his apartment for her to stay. And during this time, it was a sad thing for this to have happened to her meant she was no longer eligible to get married. So that meant that she was uh, destined to be a single woman the rest of her life, which means her brother would end up taking care of her. So Absalom waited patiently up for two years, waiting for David to reprimand his brother, and it didn't come. But during this time, his resentment toward his dad and toward his brother became increased, steadily increased. So he came up with another plan, and this plan was he was going to have a large feast. And with this feast, he wanted to invite all of his half-brothers and step-brothers to come. And so David reluctantly let them all go. All, and I don't remember how many of them was crown prince, but it was more than just Absalom and Amnon. It was several dozens of them. So they all go to this feast. And while they're at the feast, Absalom has his brother Amnon killed. So they all come running back in a panic, you know, thinking they're going to be next, which was didn't happen. And so Absalom, after this deed was happened, he escaped and went and went and hid it out, hid out in the wilderness. And he was out there for a while, at least a year or two. David mourned the, the death of his son, Abdon. And then after a while, he started begging Absalom to come back. And for a while, Absalom was kind of concerned because he thought... His dad was using that as a hidden agenda to get him back in the castle so he could kill him. But as time went on, I think he realized his dad was really sincere. So he did come back, but he came back with another plan. He said, you know, since I'm back in the castle, this gives me the opportunity to be able to undermine my, my dad and to usurp his authority and possibly take over the throne. And he had his young guys, men who worked with him, and they were all in agreement with him and encouraging him that he could be a better king than David.
So David wanted started to plan an insurrection. And after Jan January 6th of last year, most people know what an insurrection is. So during this time, David gets wind of what Absalom was planning. And what he did was he took his wives and his children and he had some some followers that were with him, about 600 men, and they all decided it was time to flee. So in the dead of night, they all leave the castle and they all go running out into the night to in the wilderness in order to get away from Absalom. And so when we read in 2 Samuel 15, this is verses 13 through 18, if you'd like to turn there, it talks about, and I'm going to go ahead and keep reading for time's sake. It says, and there came a messenger to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel Israel are after Absalom. So I mean, a lot of the men in the, in the country were siding with Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that there were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. In other words, he didn't want them to attack them in the castle. And also, he did not want a siege to come upon the city where a lot of innocent people would get hurt. And the king went forth, and in all his household after him. And the king left ten women, which were concubine, to keep the house. Now, concubine... I guess in modern terms would be uh, like a common law wife, someone that he is with, but he's not legally married to. And these ladies were some older women that he felt that would be safe being there with Absalom. He figured, well, they're older women, so he's not going to really bother them. But that was not true. So the king went forth and all the people after him, and he tarried in a place that was far off. And all his servants passed on beside him, all the Sheratites and all the Paleotites and all the Gittites. There were 600 men which came after him from Goth. Now Goth, if you remember, was the place where Goliath was from passed on before king. Now the Cherites and the, and the Palerites, these were an elite group of mercenaries and they were a part of David's royal bodyguards. And so they all left and he, and he left a few servants behind to just kind of watch the, the castle. A lot of these were probably too old to do a lot of traveling and whatever. So now we're going to get down into Psalm 3. And the first verse, it says, <clears throat> Lord, how are they that increase who trouble me? Many are they who rise up against me. And whether you realize it or not, a psalm is a song. So this was really a song that David was singing to the Lord. So in this writing, David knew he was in great deal of trouble and he was complaining to God and he mentioned before as I mentioned before his own son Absalom was leading an insurrection against him and many of his so-called friends and associates joined his son's revolt against him except for a faithful few that went with him so, like I said, he had about 600 men that went with him, along with his wives and his children. And in verse 2, we talked about, it says, Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. And it said, Selah. Now, Selah means to pause 
and think calmly about this. Now, David's had some so-called friends, and they felt that they knew better about what the situation was all about than David did. And they, um, even though they were with him, they were trying to make him feel bad about himself, that it was his fault that this was happening to him. And he believed, and David kind of believed along with him, I think, deep down. Because after all, he was, because of his lack of response for the rape of Tamer, his daughter, and also because he had committed adultery with his wife Bathsheba. So he felt like these were God's way of getting back at him was because he allowed these two incidents to go on without making correction. <clears throat> so David and a lot of people end up committing suicide rather than seeking God or even if they know that there is a God. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, And there have no temptation taken you, but each, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, and who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that we may be able to bear it. So he lets us know that in spite of what the circumstances are, if you will cry out to God, there is a way out. It may not seem like it in the beginning, but there is. In verse 3, it says, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. So in spite of the desperation from the family, desertion, I'm sorry, from the family and the friends and being tormented by others, David knew that God had not deserted him and that God was still his shield. And we know that a shield is a hedge of protection that surrounds a person when they're in battle to protect them from arrows and spears that are thrown at them. How many times have you been in difficult situations and people have wondered, how come you stay so calm? It's because of that shield, that hedge of protection that God has placed around us. He said, regardless of all of that, David had confidence in God and could, and that could not be shaken. We can look at going to jump over into the book of Job. And in chapter 12, I'm just going to paraphrase. Job went through a hard time. He, his kids, kids were killed. His cattle was killed and scattered. He ended up with boils and sickness in his body. And to top it all off, his wife ends it and says, why don't you just curse God and die? Then he has three friends to show up to there to console him. And what they end up doing was coming to more or less tell him what he must have done wrong in order for all of this tragedy to come upon him. And he listened to them talk and ran and whatever they thought that was true. But then in Job 13, he said one thing to them. This is in Job 13. Verse 15, 16, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. So what he was saying, regardless what happened, what was going on, that he was still going to trust in God. You know, and that's something that's so important that we need to learn today, regardless with all the stuff that's going on today, COVID and floods, tsunamis, volcanoes, we still have to hold on to, as some people say, to God's unchanging hand, but we need to hold on because he is our source. He is our source. 
So if you read the last chapter in, in Job, you'll find out that God reprimanded his three friends. In fact, he even told them to offer up, a, to take their sacrifice to Job so that he could do a sacrifice for them because he would not accept theirs. So God also restored to Job twice what he had lost. So in spite of it all, Job just hung in there with God. So that's one of the things that part of this is, is God your shield. God is your protector. He is your hedge. So getting back to David, David didn't pray to God when he says, he didn't say, please God, shield me from my enemies. What he said was, Lord, you are my shield. And he didn't say that out of pride, but he said that out of confidence and who his God was. How many times have you stood bold and said, I'm going to trust in God no matter what I see or what's going on. That's the part that's so important. And God, that's what he relishes. He says, do this in, in, in communion, do this in remembrance of me. It's like saying, have confidence in me that I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. So, in Psalms 91, it talks about a shield and a buckler. And I'm going to just kind of share that with you, what the difference is real quick. A buckler is a small shield. They usually carry it on their arm. They carry it into battle. And they use this more or less in arm-to-arm -arm combat. A shield is usually a larger sh shield, and they still carry it on their arm. But when they get into battle, it usually has a, a, a point on the end where they can stick it in the ground and kind of anchor it. And they can stoop down behind it to protect them. And if it's more than one, they can hook their shields together, which will make even a bigger fortress for them to stand behind. And that's what God is. He's our hedge. Our hedge is not just one little scrub, but a hedge can be several in order to protect us. That part is so important for us to understand. In verse 4, it says, I cried unto the Lord, with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. And it says, Selah. Selah means to pause and to calmly think about this. So what he's saying is David knew that God would hear him if he cried out to him. And he also knew that in spite of Absalom being in Jerusalem, being trying to claim himself as king, but God was still on the throne. And even though God was on his heavenly throne and Absalom was right now temporarily on the earthly throne, that part was not going to last because God was still going to see David through. In verse 5, it says, I lay down and slept and wakened for the Lord to sustain me. It's so important for us to realize that it's a gift of God. It's a blessing from God to be able to sleep. A lot of us take going to bed at night and getting a good sleep. We take it for granted. But there are a lot of people who can. I remember when I worked at the hospital, we used to have a patient who at night he could, would not sleep. We would give him sedatives to try to get him to sleep, give him a bath to calm him down, and he would still be putting his call light on at night because he couldn't sleep. And one night I went in the room, we had done everything we could for him, gave him a back rub, gave him his medicine, whatever. I said, Mr. Smith, I'm just going to use the name Smith, that's not his real name. I said, can I pray for you? And he said, sure. So I prayed and bound up that little spirit little tormenting spirit in his life and told him, now I want you to go to sleep and I'll see you in the morning. And he turned over and he slept. He said, nurse, that was the best sleep I've ever had. So the next night I was off and he kept telling, I need to talk to that nurse that was here last night so she can pray with me so I can sleep. 
I hope the man one day found out what was going on and was able to get his life together. And over the phone, I prayed for him, for him to get another night's sleep. So people said, well, you can't do that over the phone. Yes, you can, because there's no space and there's no time and space in prayer in the spiritual realm. So that part is so important. And we also saw that in Acts 12, 2 and 8 with Peter in prison, that Jesus had already prophesied to Peter and said that he would live to be an old man. So now Herod is claiming that he was going to execute Peter the next morning. And Peter, they had him in a cell, chained between two guards, and locked inside of a cell with two guards standing outside. And he's sound asleep. They're saying they're going to kill him in the morning. He's sound asleep. The angel comes into the cell, had to kick Peter to wake him up because he was sleeping so sound. Told him to wake up, get dressed, and come on. And he walked him out. So can you imagine, you got two guards in the cell with you who didn't wake up. While you getting dressed and putting your sandals on or whatever, the door opens automatically. The two guards outside the jail cell didn't see him, and he walked out a couple more doors. No one saw him, and he, when he knew anything, he was standing outside the jail because his faith and confidence was in God. And I'm going to give you a couple more scriptures to think about along that line. You have Psalms 4.8. It says, I will lay me down in peace and sleep from thou, O Lord, only maketh me dwelleth in safety. In Proverbs 3.24, it says, when thou layest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down and thy sleep shall be sweet. So it's important to know that he can give you peace in the midst of a turmoil. In verse 6, it says, And I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people that will set themselves against me around about. Now, David was a warrior, so having gone into battle was nothing new for him. And he knew on many occasions when he went into battle, God was his victor and helping him to be successful in those battles. So, he already knew how to fight, and he already knew God was there for him. So that part did not bother him. So, and then we say in Psalms 91, 7, it says, And thousands shall fall at thy side, <clears throat> and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh me. So if you think about that, can you imagine you being surrounded by ten thousand people and not being in a panic mode? we probably all would be screaming and hollering and trying to find some place to hide. In verse 7, it says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone, and thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Now, rise, O God, was a military phrase that was used by Moses in Numbers 10.35. And he was asking God then to go forth to defend Israel and lead them to victory. So that was just part of the thing that they would say, arise, O Lord, because they wanted God to go before them. And he says, smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. And this meant breaking their power over him and restraining their enemies so that they could not do them any harm and causing them to be silenced and compounding their speaking and causing them to be put to shame. And it says breaking teeth of the ungodly. And this means to total uh, destruction, uh, domination, or defeat of the enemy. David needed more than just surviving the threat of his kingdom. He needed to be victorious over his enemy. In 2 Samuel 18, 9-33, this is a section that talks about Absalom being killed. 
Now, Absalom was riding on a donkey and ran up and through a grove of trees. Hair got caught on the branches. He couldn't get down. And one of David's uh, generals came along and killed him and threw his body in a ditch and threw some rocks on top of it. So when they, David kept asking them when the battle was over about his son, and they had to tell him that his son had died. So he mourned his son greatly, but he also didn't realize that if his son had not died, then the war would have continued because Absalom was determined that he was going to destroy his dad. So he didn't understand that in Psalms 105, 15, it says, Touch not my anointed, nor do my prophets any harm, that he has set himself up for failure. Because Samuel had come by God's word and had anointed David to be king. He didn't come to anoint Absalom to be king. And so in order for David to, to order to regain his throne, Absalom had to go. In verse 8, salvation belongeth unto the Lord, and the blessing is upon thy people. In this one it says that David understood that salvation belongeth to God, and he was concerned not only for his own victory, but for the God's hand upon the people. And he said, and your blessing upon your people God didn't pray for his own, David did not pray for his own safety, but he was praying for the people. And that's the part that was important. He prayed for the people. So when we look at this, <clears throat> as far as comparison with Jesus sin and the cross with David, David was like a type of Jesus. His compassion and his love for his son was unconditional, just as Jesus' love is for us. David hid from his enemies toward the end, just like Jesus evaded his enemies that sought to kill him. As David, um, close friends and associates deserted him, during his time of, of, of desperation, Jesus' disciples deserted him. Even when he crossed over the brook of Kindred, that was David, Jesus crossed over the same brook, and we read about that in John 18.1, uh, that he crossed over the brook of Kindred. Now, Kindred in Old Testament is, is in Hebrew. I think it's, it's spelled a little different in the New Testament because it's in Greek, but it's the same brook. And he entered into the Garden of Gethsemane, but even there he was still surrounded with enemies. Jesus continued to show his unconditional love for us by dying on the cross. And God the Father was Jesus' glory and lifter of his head after he went through this terrible ordeal for us just as he was for David. And Jesus was lifted back into his position and honor in heaven, just as David was placed back on his earthly throne here on earth as king. So in summary, we see how in spite of the turmoil and drama that David went through, his trust and belief in God did not waver. So my question to you is, if you were in David's shoes, who would you trust? Would your trust be in God or would your trust be in man? Selah, think about it. So in review, we covered the verses, and I said we went through Psalms 3, 1 through 8. We covered verses in 1 Sam, 2 Samuel 15, 13 through 18, 1 Corinthians 10, 3, Job 12, Psalms 91, Acts 12, 2 through 8, Psalms 4 and 8, Proverbs 3, 24, Numbers 10, 34, 2 Samuel 18, 9, through 13, Psalms 105, 15, and John 18, 1. 
So that's the end of my message, and I thank you for your time. So now what we're going to do, I'm going to ask you, since we have a few minutes, and we will talk about God being your shield, but in order for him to be your shield, you have to be one of his children. So my question to you today is, if you have accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and if you haven't, well, guess what? You have that golden opportunity to do that right now. You don't have to wait and go to church and sit through two or three song choir selections and whatever, but you can accept Jesus now. And during this time of pandemics and stuff, it's always good to be on the winning team. So if you would bow your head with me and repeat this prayer, I would greatly appreciate it. God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Your word says, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So I know you won't cast me out, but you take me in, and I thank you for it. You also said in your word that if I should confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I'm confessing with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Son of God, and he was raised from the dead for my justification. And I receive him right now as my Lord and Savior. You also said in your word, that if I were asked for the Holy Spirit, you would give him to me. I'm asking you right now to fill me with your Holy Spirit. So I thank you for saving me and for filling me with your precious Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. If you just repeated that prayer and you were truly sincere, then congratulations. Welcome to the family. You are now a child of the King. And we thank you so much. And the angels in heaven are rejoicing. And I would like for you, if you don't mind, if you said this prayer for the first time today, that you let give us heads up on, on that you did. If you don't mind, you can contact us at the number at the bottom of the screen or on our website. You will also see our website. And let us know that you've accepted Jesus. And we would be more than happy to send you some information to help you on your journey. And if you like, you can always come and join us. We do have service on Sundays. So if you would like to join us, you are more than welcome. But you can call the number and get directions on the times and for the services. So right now, if you don't mind, we're going to do a closing prayer. And then... You can carry on with your day. You can bow your heads if you don't mind. Father, we leave this place, but not your presence. And help us to share your love, joy, and peace with those we encounter this week. Teach us how to pour God's abundant goodness upon our families, friends, and colleagues. Help us to be hands to help others be words of encouragement to those who are oppressed and the arms of comfort to the hurting. We thank you that your favor has no end and it lasts for a lifetime. We ask that your face should shine upon us and that you should open the doors of our lives and for our loved ones. We thank you for a hedge of protection around our loved ones and ourselves as we move through our day and we give us a heart of wisdom to hear your voice and to make us strong in your grace and mercy in the name of Jesus.